Well, hello everybody. Welcome to the fifth installment of Webinar Wednesday focused on bridge preservation hosted by the Concrete Preservation Alliance. I'm Scott McCullough with Vector Corrosion Technologies and I'll be kicking things off today. Uh, we're just about halfway through our year long series that runs uh, until July 2021 and there's still lots more uh, great webinars to come with topics of PT evaluation, sorry, I should say post tension evaluation and protection, um, concrete culvert rehabilitation, uh, and much more. Um, if you've joined us before, the uh, Webinar Wednesday program is organized by the Concrete Preservation Alliance that draws on its members' expertise uh, and uh, aims to share best practices and innovative approaches to saving structures and uh, to, from premature demolition. Our membership continues to grow every month when we host this webinar, and I'd like to welcome Akor Tech from Indonesia and uh, Cherco System Professionals from Italy. Welcome to our little alliance. It's growing rapidly. It should, be, should come as no surprise to anyone around here that uh, construction in general, and more specifically, concrete production and placement consume a ton of natural resources and produce a lot of solid waste, excess heat, and pollution. Preserving structures through repair and protection can be a wise financial move, but also can uh, have significant environmental benefits that can be quantified. So if you look at the calculator on the right hand side of your screen here, uh, this is a handy calculator that the Concrete Preservation Alliance um, has, uh, has designed to help owners and engineers quantify the impact of their decisions. Uh, and you can check it out at wesafestructures.info. Speaking of wesafestructures.info, here's the website. Um, all of the webinar registrations uh, where you are now, as well as any other events, uh, will be posted here under, under the events tab. And all past webinar recordings and slide decks will be here uh, free of charge a few days after each webinar. Uh, also, which reminds me, today's webinar will be recorded and posted here in a few days, along with uh, David's slides. So please check back often. There's always new content to enjoy. Um, but brings me to our, our guest speaker, uh, Mr. David Simpson. He's a veritable rock star in the field of concrete and cathodic protection. Um, and he's also our Euro the European Divisional Manager for Vector Corrosion Technologies Limited. David holds a first class honors degree in chemistry and biology from Aston University in Birmingham. Prior to working for Vector, he held positions of corrosion product manager for Fosrock International and technical manager at Fosrock Limited, where he specialized in electrochemical repair methods and cement technology. David is the foregoing chairman of the Corrosion Protection Association and is an i Level 4 Senior Cathodic Protection Engineer for Reinforced Concrete. Dave loves rugby and lives in Birmingham with his wife, Sophie, and two children, Ilsa and George. So we'll get Dave going here. This is his um, first slide, so I don't want to steal his thunder. He probably wants to walk you through the itinerary himself, but I'll maybe start off by asking you, Dave, can you uh, just tell us what's going on here in this photo that you're in? You have a lot more hair there, and it looks like you're doing something with a monitoring station on a bridge. I uh, definitely have more hair. Uh, it's, uh, it's, a, it's the oldest photo I can find of myself being on a job site. It was one of the early uh, first projects of a Gowershield CC system. Uh, it's actually a job that we we still monitor today, so it's uh, it's still quite relevant. Uh, but yeah, that's the the oldest one that you you asked me for one. That's the oldest one I could find. <laughs> so thank you for the introduction. Start. Um, I think all these things sound a lot better when you uh, when you hear them being read back to yourself. So anyway, um, my presentation today is going to be broken down into two specific um, sections. The first section is really going to give a little bit of background to cathodic protection. Obviously, with webinar uh, series like this, we get a lot of people from different backgrounds. Some people are fully aware of cathodic protection and its uses. Some people are not. So um, just for out of courtesy, we're going to use a, a, a little background. I won't spend too much time on there, uh, but again, it's always good. And then we're going to look at so like the decision making process when we're selecting cathodic protection and we're looking at cathodic protection and which system to use. Obviously, the decision making process we have to do. And then we're really looking at identifying and understand where corrosion is going to occur, which helps us bring about this approach, which we call targeted protection. 
I then follow the second element with a number of real life examples where we've used this technique. Uh, and then I really want to introduce a new sort of technology that we've uh, innovated and developed over the past, uh, past few years and give an example of, of passivation, which uh, is something that will make far more sense when we get to that, that section. So anyway, that's me and I will head on. So for those people who are not fully aware, cathodic protection is a technique which we use to reduce, significantly reduce the corrosion rate of, uh, of steel in concrete. Now, um, from a concrete perspective, we specifically separate them into two different types of system. On the one side, we have what we call impressed current cathodic protection. And on the other side, we have what we call galvanic cathodic protection or GCP. Um, and fundamentally, they all work in exactly the same way. They basically, it's a way of passing a current onto the steel and reducing the corrosion rate. The difference really comes in uh, to its own in terms of how we apply that, that current, how we apply that charge upon the steel. For an impressed current cathodic protection system, we apply that via a mains power. So we take AC current converted to DC current and we pass it onto the steel via a control equipment. Um, some people are not aware that you can you can pass current through concrete. Obviously, it's ionic current and not electrical current. But again, in terms of the electrolyte, if those are terms that are relevant to you, uh, obviously the concrete is the uh, is the electrolyte in our system and sustains the ionic flow, which sustains the uh, the current going through the concrete. Now, from a galvanic perspective, the technology is identical. The only difference is where we get the electron source or the current source. And from a galvanic CP point of view, that comes from normally a more active metal. In reinforced concrete, it's pretty much always a zinc or zinc derivative. Um, and basically, we connect the two together. We create a cell or a battery. The current flows between the two and CP is formed and we get a reduction in the corrosion rate of the steel. So, like I say, I'm trying to not go into too much detail, too much technical information, but I think we have to set some scene in terms of the terminology that we use, uh, which is going to be used throughout the rest of the presentation. Now, in terms of a bit of a history, obviously, so some people cathodic protection is a new technique that they may have heard of in, 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 the, in passing, they may be fully aware of it, but it's been around for a long time. I mean, the first systems were trialed back in 1959. Uh, and before that it was used on pipelines. But since the mid 70s, its adoption in concrete has increased year upon year. And around the early 90s and late 90s, new galvanic uh, technology was introduced. And from then the number of systems and the type of systems have exponentially increased from there really, which I think is only a positive. Now, in this uh, graphic here, I have mentioned realkalization and desalination. They are systems that, that Vector have, and there are systems that are in the marketplace. They are a derivative, in my mind, of CP, but not specifically what we're going to be discussing today. But again, in terms of a timeline, that's 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 included from that perspective. Now, one of the first um, questions that normally gets asked when we introduce cathodic protection to, to engineers, to clients and to owners is, uh, which system do we use? And I know it's a cliche, but the answer to that really is there's no right or wrong answer. It comes down to a number of variables that are very unique to that specific structure, that specific situation. Um, and, and that's part of our role. That's part of the engineer's role is to is to take into account all of these variables and come up with the right solution. So typically we go through a decision matrix um, and we ask a number of questions. And if we can't answer those questions, we go and find them. But I've tried to break these down into a summary form on this slide uh, because they are important and things that we have to consider as engineers and as owners uh, when we look into extend the life of structures. So the first one, which may be obvious, but it, it is it's probably the, one of the most important elements is uh, what is the extent of the corrosion? Because without knowing where, how much uh, and what the probability of corrosion is going to be going forward, it's very difficult for us to assess uh, a, a protection type or to choose a different system. And, and I can't stress enough, you'll see it a number of times through my presentation, that understanding corrosion should be the number one priority of any engineer when you're looking at corrosion related issues and you're looking to use cathodic protection of some form. And probably the second biggest element of this is, is the budget. How much money do you have? Uh, 
I'm going to use some analogies in here that may, may or may not make sense, but realistically, we may all want a Ferrari, but the reality is we can only afford a Fiat. And, and the same comes to cathodic protection. Some systems are far more expensive than others. You get benefits typically, uh, the more expensive it goes and you get flexibility, but you may not always be able to afford those systems. So understanding the extent of corrosion and the budget that you have at hand are always going to be important decision um, parameters that we're looking at when we're looking at corrosion and, and protection systems associated to them. Now, life expectancy is, is another area that's uh, a very interesting point. If you're looking at 50 to 100 years life, then you're going to go down a certain path. If you're looking to 10 to 20 to 30 years, you've got other options that are available to you. So again, as a, as a, as a question, as a decision, that's one of the first things that we would ask uh, for any engineer. Uh, working on a system. And the final one is a bit of an obscure one, but it does sometimes have a big impact on the type of cathodic protection system that you may use, which is the access on the site. Um, we have one specific example at the minute that we're working on where we have a bridge which is next to a railway line and we only have access to that railway line maybe four to five hours at any one time. And they are using the full impress current cathodic protection on that system, but they're looking at alternatives because they only have a short window. So again, you have these situations where access may determine the type and system that you are actually using. But these are the things that when we look at the type of system and how we approach corrosion protection, these are the things that we would always look to try and define. Now, I call this the orthodox ideology. This is typically the decision making process that used to occur. Thankfully, things have moved on since then, but I think it's important to see where we've come from. And really, we lived in a duality world. We lived in a position where you either do nothing uh, and just carry out basic repair or you fully install a global CP system. Those were typically the two ends of the spectrum that were involved in the decision making process. And then in the centre here, we had, well, it's chlorine contaminated concrete. Let's remove it. But each one of these is going to have uh, an impact on, on what goes on and how you extend the life of structures. Um, if you tuned into um, George Serge's presentation probably two months ago now, and if you haven't, I would recommend you go and see it. He went into a lot of detail of the problems associated with carrying out just basic concrete repair into uh, chloride contaminated structures and the fact that you that leads to premature repair failure or what we classify as incipient anode formation. And again, all you're going to be doing at that point is pushing the problem down the road. You're not getting to the root cause of the problem at that. And while I wish do nothing was never the option, obviously that still is used and we come against it from time to time, typically through budget constraints. But again, if from an engineering point of view, it's not really the thing that you want to be doing uh, for our infrastructure. In the second section where you look at removal of contaminated concrete, again, this still does happen from time to time around the world, uh, but I think it's becoming less of an, uh, an issue just because of the time and the cost, obviously the health and safety element uh, around that, and, and more importantly, environmental impact. Now, whether you believe in CO2, care about CO2 is, is not really the point. Around the world, it's becoming a bigger factor, and I think we all understand that uh, OPC and the manufacture of OPCs is not the most kind to CO2 generation. So anything that we can preserve what is there and extend its use further um, is going to be a, a, a really positive step for us. And I say it may not be so important now, but I think it's becoming more and I definitely see it uh, occurring more uh, around the world as we move forward. And then when we look at full global systems, um, again, technically, that you can't argue about it at all. It is, it is, it is a, a technical viable option. You can't argue against it. But the problem with it is, it's a very large investment, and I tend to find that that only occurs when you've got very large infrastructure and you're looking at large projects. It doesn't tend to be used on much smaller projects, um, and I think because of that, the use of cathodic protection as a whole. Um, its adoption around the world has, has not been as great because of this disparity between the sort of the small to medium and the large infrastructure that it tends to be used on. Now, understanding the problem, I told you it was going to come up again and it'll keep coming up. Um, understanding the problem, I think, is by far the most important element. The more that we can understand our structures, the more that we can define the corrosion risk and ascertain risk to that and risk management, the better the solution is going to be that we're going to come out with. Now, 
as a general sweeping statement, um, corrosion typically is not uniform over a structure. And I've given a number of examples here of why I believe that. Um, the first example here on the left hand side, as you look in, is a marine environment. So in a marine environment is typically going to be have a very different risk profile to something that's an inland bridge away from seawater, away from a chloride source. And uh, the uh, jo Jason Chodotek's presentation, again, I would refer you to that, went into a lot of detail in terms of the marine environment and specifically the zones within marine environments that are going to have completely different corrosion risk profiles. So you have the atmospheric zone, you have the submerged zone, and you have the, the tidal and the, the splash zone area, all going to have their own different corrosion risk, and a different solution may be viable for each of those specific areas. One that's not talked about too much, but I think is well understood is obviously the concrete cover to the to this reinforcement is the first line of defense against corrosion. It's what limits the chloride uh, diffusion into the concrete, but it also limits chlor uh, carbonation. Uh, and obviously, as a, as a point, it, it passivates the steel, which stops it corroding in the first place. So we all know that we design structures with adequate um, cover. The problem and the reality is once you get the site, things become less controlled QC isn't always perfect and we can have areas of very low cover uh, on the same structure and areas of very high cover and that's going to lead to variability in the actual corrosion risk and I've got some examples uh, going forward just to demonstrate that in real life and then the last one and again these are not ex exclusive there's the, uh, an inclusive every option that's available in terms of uh, corrosion risk but specific structural elements also lead to heightened corrosion risk and typically i think we're all aware of half joints but then you have day joints construction joints cracking uh, thermal cracking movement cracking all of those things are going to accelerate uh, the risk of corrosion, but it may not be a uniform thing. It may be only certain select areas of that structure that are going to uh, show that risk profile. Now, here are a couple of real life examples of some testing that was carried out. Uh, this is a delamination survey or spalling uh, survey that was carried out on a, on a, a road bridge deck. Um, and typically we'd, we'd expect to see deterioration occurring around the half joints. And you can see that that is the case here. We have delamination occurring around the half joints, which we probably could have all predicted because of their moisture and because of their chloride contamination with time. But what's interesting is we probably wouldn't be able to predict as easily these other spilled areas. And you can see that it is not, it's not uniform over the whole structure. Different elements of the structure are gonna corrode at different times. Now, this is only telling us the areas that have actually started corrosion. It's not telling us the areas that are corroding ongoing, but haven't caused any physical damage. So a delamination survey is very good, but it's only one element, one technique in our arsenal that we can use to identify corrosion and identify corrosion risk. But it's a, it is a useful technique uh, in terms of building up bill of quantities, and it has another useful point, and I'll, I'll come to that in a, a little while when we combine it with another technique. Here is an example of a cover survey that was carried out on a real life structure. And again, you can see the red areas where you have low cover, which is typically 10 millimeters or a quarter of an inch, which obviously is not as good as something that's four inches or 100 millimeters deep. And the areas that are 100 millimeters deep in terms of concrete cover, the probabilities that those areas are highly unlikely to show signs of deterioration unless there are other factors involved over the lifetime of this structure. But clearly, the areas of low cover, and that could be down to the placement of steel, it could be starter bars, it could be link bars close to the surface. Uh, all of those things are going to be the areas where corrosion is likely going to occur and deterioration is going to occur. But when you're looking at cathodic protection and where you'd apply it, again, the area that you'd look to provide it in, the, if you're just looking at um, concrete cover as the, as the variable, it's a much smaller percentage of the total structure. You definitely wouldn't be looking at protecting the whole columns uh, in this instance, based purely just on the information you're getting from cover. So it is a factor, but it's not the only defining factor for us. Now, a, a technique that is close to my heart is, is half cell potential map surveys. And um, for me, they're a good technique just because they're non-destructive. Um, I hope people are aware of it, but it's, it's a way of identifying corrosion risk by taking measurements from the surface. and 
I'm sure I've got a lot of people shouting at their screen saying, oh yes, but I, I did half the potential map surveying and I went down to the steel in the high risk areas and the steel was as good as the day it was installed. And, and that is the truth, um, because what you're looking at is a probability. You're not looking at absolute corrosion rates. And that's a very important distinction. And the way I look at it and the way I rationalize it in my mind is the fact that if you think about which are the areas that are going to likely corrode between year five and year 10, these are the areas. These are the areas that have got an environment that is conducive to corrosion and is going to accelerate the corrosion process. So I think that's the way we look at it and that's the way that it's typically used, but it's a very quick technique and it gives us a lot of information and it can be used quite visually as we've seen with the other techniques. Now this is a, a pier section of a, a road bridge. Um, so if you imagine the, the, the road is, is running parallel to, to what you can see on the screen. And if we do the half cell potential maps and we do a delamination server, which you can see there, the delaminations tend to be, and these are the, the etched areas that you can see here, are related to where the high risk areas are. So the red areas are going to be the high risk areas, the green are going to be the, the, the low probability of corrosion. So you can see that the corrosion is is tends to be concentrated in the bottom section and that's and that makes sense in terms if you imagine cars driving past here you have splash in the winter you have chloride contamination that's occurring much much lower down in the piers than it is at the tops now the example here of column 5 where you have this area here is probably related to surface water coming from the top I haven't got a picture of this this bridge to hand, but uh, there is a there is water coming from the top, and that's probably down to water management. But you can see there are clear areas of high corrosion risk, and there are clear areas of low corrosion risk. And again, depending on the life expectancy you're trying to achieve with this structure, depends on which type of system you would go for, uh, and whether you'd go for a target approach or whether you'd go for a global approach. Now here's another example um, of, a, of a bridge deck where we've done a full half cell map survey and again the same same things happen here. We have some areas that are high risk and we have some areas that are low risk. But what's interesting with this slide is once we've eliminated the areas where we have um, delamination and we've taken away the bad concrete, we've taken away the contamination, the amount of concrete that, that is left behind is far lower than the global protection technique. And again, if you were looking to provide 50 to 100 years, then global protection would likely be a viable option for you as long as you had the money. If you weren't looking to it, then a targeted approach and, and having this information allows us to generate that targeted approach, which I think is a, is a viable option if you're looking in the, the short to medium term. And when you're thinking about short to medium, I'm thinking anywhere between 10 and, and 30 years is what I classify as the, the short to medium term. Now, as a more modern approach, as opposed to the, the, bi, the bipolar section where you do nothing or you do full uh, protection, we now have so many different systems available to us. This is not an exhaustive list. There are, are many other systems that you can use for different application types. But in general, there's a lot of different systems that are available to us. And from an engineering point of view, that is great. Not one system is going to be perfect in every scenario. I wish we could develop that, but it, it's, it's highly unlikely. So having these uh, techniques in our arsenal to use uh, and to, to extend the life of structures is really, really important. And I just want to mention one extra thing uh, that sort of started occurring in the past few years other than the Middle East, and that's the use of, uh, of CP within new construction. Now, within the Middle East, it's been commonly used as, as a global system. They have a very unique set of circumstances over there in terms of construction technique, in terms of contaminated groundwater, contaminated uh, ground, um, that global protection over there, and it's been commonly used for, for many, many years. What we're now seeing is a more targeted approach of using galvanic systems in new construction. Um, and I've got one specific example of, of a job that we have just completed uh, this year, probably completed a month ago. Uh, and again, it's an approach that the client took and worked with us to work up where those high risk areas were likely to be over the life of the structure. And we designed a system specifically around that. So really in summary, the take home points uh, that I'd like to leave you with really is, Again, the number of systems now available to treat corrosion is extending. It's going to carry on extending. I think that's a positive thing for us as engineers in terms of using these techniques to treat uh, corrosion related problems for us. And 
Each system has its own unique advantages and also related considerations. And I'll come into some of those a little later. But the realization is no one system is perfect. Anybody who ever says that, I think he's, he's telling Hawkeyes in a way, uh, it's never going to be that, that, that way. We're always going to have advantages of one system above another in a certain scenario. And until we get on site, until we understand that corrosion, we don't know which one, uh, which system we'd want to push onto that really. And this leads really to the targeted side. Corrosion is never uniform. It's difficult to predict. And if the one take home thing you, you take from this presentation today is the more testing you can do on your structure to define risk, the better the solution will be. And typically, when I say typically, the cheaper that system is likely going to be as well if you're looking at the targeted approach. And this figure here of, of, of 25 to 35% is something that is mine. You're not going to find it anywhere else. So feel free to shoot it down. But in my experience, typically we only see 25 to 35% of structures demonstrating elevated corrosion risk. And that does vary. There are exceptions to that. Certain industrial processes, certain structures are, are going to pose more of a risk in terms of global corrosion. But in, in general, <clears throat> and the typical things that we get involved in, 25 to 35% is once you, once you eliminate the delamination areas, is the areas that are going to show an elevated corrosion risk. And another thing that I, I personally have seen and um, something that rings true for me is ICCP is a very valuable technique and will continue to be a very, uh, a very uh, useful technique for us. But it's really only considered cost effective when you're treating large areas uh, and you're committed to the long term maintenance uh, and galvanic systems and fusion, which I'll explain a little later, are much more effective when we're looking at that target approach when you may only be trying to protect one beam, one column, one small area. Um, they are far more cost effective. They're a lot quicker to install and they have their own advantages as well, which we'll, we'll sort of come to. Um, so the next section really I'd like to just talk you through a number of uh, examples of where this targeted approach has been used. Um, so this is a bridge a bridge deck and you can see that there are a number of delaminated areas uh, there but luckily what the engineer did is they did a full half cell potential map. I know it's not as clear as maybe it should be but obviously the darker areas are where the corrosion risk was higher and they identified just some small areas that they wanted to protect outside of the patch repairs. Uh, they did a, a, a type one uh, protection for the repairs and they looked at a, a discrete galvanic anode system for those high areas. And there were only 26 anodes that they were looking to do. They didn't have a huge budget to spend, uh, but they wanted to provide some more protection to those areas because they didn't want to come back and carry out more repairs. So. There's no way that a full ICCP system would be a viable option in here. I mean, this is an extreme, uh, it's a very small section, but again, it means that the application of CP can be used in these, these types of scenarios because it's a more cost effective and more targeted approach as a frame. We're going to protect the whole, the whole bridge surface. And here are just a couple of photographs of the actual installation. So these are the type one anodes, the, the incipient anode or uh, patch anode or ring effect anodes uh, that have been installed around the perimeter of the repair, as you can see, and then you've got the completed structure. But I just wanted to include a couple of these photographs just to show the typical application method. Um, I, don't, I can't spend too, too long on there. Maybe it can be a, a topic for another webinar. Uh, in the future, but typically when we're looking to install discrete embedded anodes, we would look at marking out where the steel was first. It's it's fairly obvious that that would be the case, but again, we'd mark out where the steel is, and then we'd position the anodes so that they didn't uh, correspond with the steel itself. And then we'd core or we'd drill the anodes or rock drill, depending on where you are in the world, into the into those locations. And then we'd embed the anodes. So you can see the anodes here have been embedded with a backfill mortar. And then they're linked together with a wire and a connector system. And typically we install them uh, 20 anodes in a string and we have a, a steel rebar connection at each end. Um, we do that typically, I get asked this question a lot, uh, quite a lot. You can run the whole system, thousands of anodes off a single um, steel connection as long as you have steel continuity. The problem is if you lose that one steel connection, you've lost the whole um, system. So we tend to split the risk and reduce the risk by making, making multiple steel connections and like we say typically it's every 20 anodes. 
The tops of these anodes are then obviously filled and conditioned, and then the system is fully functional at that point. Again, here's another example of a bridge. I'm sure you've all seen bridges like this, and I'm sure you'll all see lots of bridges again. But what was unique with this is the, the client came to, to, to us um, and already done the testing and already identified where the corrosion problem was and, and commissioned us to do a design just in the areas that they identify as high corrosion risk. This is what we did. This was the solution that we came up with. So we had a different type of system because they had still congestion in certain areas. And we looked to protect just this bottom section and through half cell essential mapping, chloride mapping, uh, chloride profiling, sorry, they'd identify this area. We also protected some cross beam and we also protected some columns. But in total, I would say we were only looking at maybe 15 to 20 percent of the structure maximum um, and again it wasn't a massive structure i think the anode number was close to 400 discrete anodes on this structure so it's not a massive structure it's not a massive system and again impressed current cathodic protection is highly unlikely to be competitive in this type of scenario and i think again it fits perfectly into this type of uh, protection of targeted protection using galvanic systems now, as promised, this is the, the new construction project that, we, that we've just completed. Now, it tends to take a client that's forward thinking in terms of the long term risk associated with corrosion on structures. And obviously, the client didn't have enough money to provide protection everywhere. It would have increased the costs considerably of the build. But what they did is they, they took a pragmatic approach to it and, and worked with us to identify the likely areas where excess chloride contamination was going to occur and where water was more likely to transport that chloride. And we came up with the uh, the solution where we would protect these outer edges because this is where the water management was going to be and also the half joints, you, or the joints, it's not half joint, just the joint sections of this deck. Um, obviously you can't see it here, but in the next photograph you can see a schematic of where we place the anodes. And then there was another water management element at various positions along here that we also protected and you can see that in some photographs in the moment. So this was the typical arrangement where we had protection exclusively on the end areas all the way the length and then at the joints we had a, a row of anodes uh, in there to provide protection uh, from, from new. I could spend a whole presentation on new construction and the use of anodes on there so if you have any questions please just post them at the end and I will try my best to answer them but it's quite a an interesting topic and, and I'd say one that maybe we can we can include in a, in a future webinar so here are the anodes some examples of their installation and you can see here the, the whole where the water management is going to be and you can see the number of anodes has been increased in this area because of the probability of corrosion and you can see the anodes being placed here just typically in the in the other sections i don't actually have a photograph a completed photograph of um, the joint section but again i think you get the the idea another example um, is this archway and basically, uh, again, the client had done the work, they'd done the testing, they'd come to us with that information. And in that instance, again, the same as the others, they'd identified where they wanted the solution to be installed. Uh, and, and what they did is they installed the system on the inside of the arches and they'd designated a matrix, a risk matrix that they'd come up with. And we installed galvanic systems uh, into those areas which they deemed as, as high risk. So again, you can see from this, this one drawer, it's only one of a number. You can see not, corrosion was not uniform everywhere. It was actually identified in areas which were common. It was probably where flooding had occurred, where chloride had accumulated and water had been. And this is, again, the installation, very similar to the other system, but uh, probably a, a lot more rhinodes, but again, far fewer than what it would be if we were protecting the, the whole structure in its totality. So, Part of my role, um, I guess, is R&D. I look after the R&D for our, for our company and, and we're always looking to advance cathodic protection, whether it be impressed, whether it be galvanic, we're always looking to, to further the technology. And typically when we're looking for those areas to develop, we're always looking at the limitations of the technology. That's what we typically do. And I just wanted to go through some of these in terms of where the technology is going, and where innovation is going and how we we, we're trying to, to break down some of these limitations as best as we can. So if we look at traditional impressed current cathodic protection, some of the limitations include continuous monitoring. And 
I make a comment all the time that, that impressed current Catholic protection is for life, not just for Christmas. And that's the reality of the situation. If you if you are going to spend the money on an impressed system, you're going to be monitoring it 365 days a year. And if your your life expectancy is 50 years or 100 years, you're going to be monitoring it for that period of time. If you have any worries about that, ICCP is not the not the system for you. Um, and also, as we said before, you have control equipment, you have uh, the transformer rectifiers, which are all computer based. They're going to fail over time and they're going to need replacing. And if you think about how many computers you'd own over a 50 year period, uh, that's the sort of intervention that you're going to have. Now, you can say that that's a limitation. It also brings advantages to the system. But those are the those are the reality situations. And I've got a uh, a slide, not uh, the next slide that sort of gives you a, a report, um, a peer review report actually on, on the longevity of ICCP system in, the co in, in one country in particular. It's the only one of its kind that I'm, uh, I'm fully aware of. And again, it gives us good insight into how these perform the long term cost of ICCP. Uh, and I've put it here, I can't go through it in a huge amount of detail, but I've put it here as a reference that you can go away and look at. And I would implore you to do that. It's a very, very good paper. Um, the other things, obviously, external power is required, and that's that's OK. If you're in a city area, then power is not really going to be a problem. If you're in a remote location, which there are many around the world, uh, then power may be a, a, a high cost to get to uh, the structure and again, maybe a, a problem for us. So when we're looking at removing these things, those are the areas of innovation that we can we can look at doing. And then obviously the design is complicated and the installation is complicated. I'm always it always makes me smile a little bit when you get an engineer that's that's put forward an ICCP system. They go on site and they realise how much wiring that has to be done. And you're talking kilometres or yeah mi miles, <laughs> I guess for today this time of night, miles worth of of wire uh, required for for large ICCP systems. And again, they're complicated. They need trunking. They need navigating around the structure, and that might be fine for some structures. For other structures, it might not be. And again, I've mentioned it multiple times, you're probably fed up with me saying it, but it's not really economical for small areas or it's not flexible for small areas in the same way. Now, if we look at traditional galvanic systems, obviously the biggest limitation is it's a sacrificial metal. It's not going to last forever. It has a finite life. So when you're looking for 50 year plus lives, the reality is you're not really going to be able to achieve that uh, definitively with a galvanic system. That's that's the reality. Um, so again, they have a finite life. And, and when we talk about the medium, the short to medium term of that 10 to 30 years, I believe I personally believe that is the the, the happy zone for where you would use a, a type of galvanic system. They also have a fixed voltage. so. Once we've made the design and we install them, we can't really change them too much. They're going to do what they do. So the design is really, really important. Um, people like to think of galvanic systems as simple, but uh, and we've tried to push them that way and design them that way. But the design behind it is, is anything but simple and the technology is anything but simple. And again, I'd implore you to to go and watch um, George Serge's presentation on the development of galvanic anodes and the 20 year review of them just to see how complicated the, the development was and how much detail we went into when they were being first launched. But in terms of controllability, you don't have a lot with galvanic systems and that is a limitation. And you'll find that typically where you have a limitation, the other option gives you the advantage. So with galvanic systems, uh, typically you're looking at very low maintenance. Again, I'm sure I've got a, lots of people shouting at me saying, oh yes, but you should monitor it and stuff. And I believe maintenance and monitoring of two very different things. Obviously, if you've got a large number of anodes, you want to maintain them, uh, want to monitor them. We call it more validation than monitoring because you're only validating performance. You don't need to keep monitoring the system in terms of its performance because it's self-maintaining. That's the whole point of it. So when we talk about maintenance, there are not many components that we have to remove. There's not many additional elements that we have to have on site. It's just the anode. It's built that way. You install it. It, it runs uh, itself, but we would always implore some sort of level of validation. There's no external power requirement. 
they're self-regulatory in that sense. So again, that is an advantage. And that leads into a simple installation. So the speed of installation, I mean, just in wiring, you're talking 90 to 95 percent less wiring that has to be done with a galvanic system versus an ICCP system from, from a contractor's point of view. Again, they're going to be far simpler to install. And that leads themselves really to the ability to this targeted protection and this hotspot. And I keep talking about targeted hotspot because it is the title. It's not the only method that we have. It's the only, not the only way. Um, but again, it, it's a really useful technique. Um, what we look into to, to look after the infrastructure. So again, if we can have a system that system that eliminated that, that would be great. Now with ICCP, the advantages really are that they have long anode design life. Um, and again, I think it's really important to differentiate between anode and system. The anodes themselves that you install in the structures typically have a design life of 50 years to 100 years, and, and that is the case. They're not going to go anywhere. They're made of very inert materials. Um, the issue that you have in terms of life typically becomes when you're looking at the control equipment and, like I say, the electronics that we discussed before. The other element that I think is, is very, uh, very good is obviously we have a lot of performance standards based around these, so the conformance to the, to the norms uh, is a lot easier to achieve with traditional ICCP systems than it is with galvanics. So the, these considerations really led us to the, the next phase of system that we're developing, which I'll go on to now. But before that, I just want to put this up there. Um, you don't have to write this down. Obviously, all the slides are going to be available in the, in the coming week and you can look at this, but it's a very good paper that I would implore you to, to look at. But I suppose the, 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 the point for me that if you look at the, the probability of failure of non-anode components after 20 years, it was like 60%. So again, that is an independent study. I would go and look at it uh, and, and read for yourself. But I think it's a very interesting read and it does look at the long-term cost modeling of ICCP systems and the control equipment and the maintenance that are around them. So getting back to the, the presentation as a whole, obviously Gaussian fusion is the, is the new development from, from our point of view. Uh, and fusion really uh, comes from the name, really comes from combining two elements, an ICCP element and a galvanic element together in one single product. And I want to go through that with you now, if you don't mind. So this is basically uh, a schematic of the anode. Um, I wish I had more time to go into the development and, and go through the individual elements of this product, but I, I don't, I'm afraid, so I'm going to have to be uh, relatively quick on there. But basically the anode is devised into two separate elements. We have a self-powered ICCP system on the one section and on the other area we have a pure galvanic anode that is there for the longevity uh, and so basically the ICCP element works first once that's consumed we then move over to the the Gaussian C anode uh, and it typically is a, a, a virtually a Gaussian C C anode if you're a, a fully aware of our systems. Now one of the, the key parameters as we said before is a simple installation and this element was probably one of the hardest things that we had to do from an innovation point of view was keeping this single wire. Obviously, we have two systems um, and keeping the single wire was one of the, the more difficult elements of this uh, development. But it's I think it's very innovative and I think it does keep the simplicity of the system intact, which is one of our core focuses when we were developing this product. Again, if you have any questions about that, I'm more than happy to to answer them. You, you'll have my details at the end, so please feel free to send me an email and ask, but I'm more than happy to go through that in more detail for you. But in terms of the use of fusion, um, there are two ways that we can uh, use fusion as a technology. Bear in mind, fusion is just a technology. It's not really a product. And we have what we classify as a more traditional design aspect and we have a passivation design. Um, I want to spend a little bit more time on the passivation element, uh, but the traditional design is we can design stage one, the ICCP element, for up to three years of performance towards the NACE and ISO standards. So we can have an extended period of time, which is not achievable with a pure galvanic system that provides ICCP level of performance. When that cell is consumed, the system automatically switches over to a pure galvanic element and we design that as we do a Galveston CC to provide a corrosion control level of performance, which is a current density of one to seven milliamps per meter squared typically. 
Now, the passivation, I think, is 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 a new area for for us, and it's a new area in the industry, and that's why I wanted to spend a little bit more time on this point before before we finish the presentation. But basically. What we've realized over the past 20 years is the secondary effects of cathodic protection that are really interesting and realkalization and desalination. It's the secondary effects of those treatments that give us protection. So I think it's all commonly known if you're in, in the area that if you apply cathodic protection to steel, you make the steel relatively negative in nature. Chlorides are relatively negative in nature, so you get a general portion of chloride. Now, we're not trying to drag chloride out of the structure. We're only talking on the, the macro scale, the micro scale, sorry, the nano scale at the interface between the steel and the actual concrete. So if we can remove the chloride, we remove the actual source of corrosion. Also, when we apply cathodic protection, we're building up alkalinity. And we all know that alkalinity is a, uh, a protective mechanism for steel. So if we can build up the alkalinity and we remove chloride in the first initial stage, then we can repassivate, and that's what we're trying to achieve. Now, with things like impressed current cathodic protection, you can achieve that over an extended period of time, but it's far more effective if we do it in a much shorter treatment. So the phase one treatment or the stage one treatment of the passivation typically occurs in 40 to 90 days. And we tend to get this temporary treatment of high current density that passivates the steel. Once we've achieved passivation, the galvanic element takes over and we, we talk about cathodic prevention levels of current like we do with the incipient anode and uh, the, the type 1 anodes. And we look to achieve a current density of anywhere between 0.2 and 2 milliamps per meter squared. And it's the galvanic element that keeps the passivation uh, stable over the period of th up to 30 years is what we've designed in the systems to. So again, that keeps the chloride away, it maintains a passive feel and keeps the, the steel in a passive condition in the long term. Again, I'm sure there are a lot of questions and please feel free to ask those questions as, uh, as we're going through. Now, just to quickly finish, I just wanted to go through the oldest trial that we have with Fusion just to show you what a, a passivation treatment looks like. Um, so this was a, a project actually in the UK. Um, and basically we had a couple of columns that were chloride contaminated. We had a chloride level of about 2%, which is, is fairly significant. And as you can see, that corrosion is already occurring on these out extremities where the rebar is closer to the surface, as you can see here. So we did the repairs and we drilled in the anodes. And here is the schematic on this side. And we embedded reference electrodes into the structure to look at the performance in the long term. Now, I know this slide is going to look quite um, quite busy, but it, it's. I just want to walk you through it to show you what a passivation system would look like. So typically, I want you to look at the, the red and green areas because these are the reference cells that were embedded in the concrete and they give us an indication of the corrosion risk on the structure. Obviously, we know that it has 2% chloride, which is high. We know that corrosion is evident because we have deterioration on the, on the element itself. And then if we look at where the, the uh, time the potential was, it's very negative. It's minus around minus 375 millivolts, which has a great probability of 90% of corrosion. Now, between here and here, this is what we classify as stage one. So this is the, the ICCP treatment in the passivation protection. And what you can see is we look and monitor the open circuit potential, so the off potential, so what the native potential of the steel is. And with time, we are moving and shifting that steel into a positive direction. And this here is the level that's defined within the NACE standard of passivation. We're looking to include that also in the ISO standard going forward. Um, but this is basically where we, the line where we designate passivation around 150 against copper, uh, silver, silver chloride. And what you can see here is at this point here, we're in pure galvanic mode. Uh, we did a number of different things here, but basically at this point here, it's galvanic. And you can see the smaller current based upon the gradient of the line, but you can see that the, the passive level of the steel was maintained. And this is after three years now. Um, and again, we'll carry on monitoring this, but this is typically what we would expect to see as a passivation treatment of movement of the potentials in a positive direction to more passive conditions. So I'd say in conclusion, really, um, <laughs> reinforced corrosion doesn't tend to be uniform over the structure. Again, I'm sure you'll be, you'll be dreaming that phrase uh, tonight, uh, but typically 
Better corrosion testing provides better understanding, provides better risk management, and we can use this new approach, which we classify as targeted protection, to become more cost effective and robust in managing corrosion of more structures that wouldn't be really used uh, use the cathodic protection system in the past. And, and as I said, the targeted approach really is for the 10 to 30 year period. If you're looking anything longer than that, then there are different systems that I think are going to be more suitable. The number of systems available to us are, ex are extending year on year. And I can guarantee you now in the coming months and years, there are going to be more systems that are going to come out that are going to push the boundaries of performance of galvanics. And my, my total aim uh, here is to basically have no galvanic and no ICCP, we just have CP systems and that's the aim of, of our R&D group uh, is to achieve that so we, we don't have this clear differentiation, we just have CP systems that perform within the boundaries of the standard uh, all the time uh, and that's really our aim. So anyway, I'll pass you back over to, to Scott and I'll ask, answer any questions that we have. Thanks, Dave. That was fantastic. I know it's a pretty big challenge to distill uh, or to to, uh, to condense uh, decades of experience down into an hour long webinar, but uh, you did a tremendous job. I uh, really appreciate it. OK, uh, we'll start with uh, the first one that was uh, that was given by anonymous. Uh, how is the electric connection uh, to the rebars completed when the anodes are put into core holes? I think you showed a couple of photos there of the anodes in the holes. How do you make those connections? So and basically, walk through in detail. yeah, we have a wire that comes out of the anode and basically we connect that wire to a ring loop, a loop wire, if you think of that, and then we make a connection to the steel from that loop wire. So that can be made in multiple ways, self-tapping, riveted, uh, braid. It, you, there's a number of ways that you can actually make the connection to the steel, but basically the anode is connected to a loop wire and it's the end of those loop wires that are connected to the reinforcement to make the negative connection. Gotcha. OK, um, next one here is on the bridge deck that you uh, that you showed there. Uh, will corrosion start uh, when the sacrificial anodes are expired, when they're fully consumed? Does, does it happen right away or is there a delay? Well, I think obviously, as we said, we talked about the secondary effects when you're applying cathodic protection of any kind, you repel chloride from the steel and you build up alkalinity. Now, can we quantify that extended period? So when the system dies, it's highly unlikely that corrosion is going to miraculously occur it's very difficult for us to quantify that time but it's not going to be a, 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 a it's not going to be an assist something that happens straight away there's going to be a time element to it and and typically we talk about holistic approaches when we're looking at targeted protection so you're not just going to be reliant upon um, the cathodic protection system, you may have waterproofing systems, surface treatments that are going to minimise water ingress, and that's going to have an, a, an extending effect and a reduction in the corrosion rate as well. So again, I wouldn't look at it as a single cathodic protection system. You're probably using other systems as well that are going to benefit the structure as a whole. Great. OK, the questions are now flowing in. People are starting to get more interested here. Wonderful. Um, so could you uh, have uh, could you have used two stage anodes in the repairs that you showed on the bridge deck example instead of galvanic anodes? Uh, only one type of anodes are on are, are only one type of, an of anode on site. So what, what, what would the benefit be of using a two phase anode instead of a galvanic in a repair? OK, so there are a number. I mean, I'd, I'd argue watch this space. It's sort of an area of development for us for us right now. I, I guess they are, are twofold. Obviously, we can get ICCP level performance from, from that type of system. And typically, we're using the traditional method if we did that. So you'd probably have three years worth of ICCP level of protection instead of cathodic prevention, which is typically what we design for now. So that's an, an advancement. Obviously, we have a high voltage, so um, when you have a resistance issue, maybe that there's an advancement uh, there. And typically, we can design for longer lives. So you typically, you're looking 15 to 20 years with a pure galvanic system type M anode. We're designing up to 30 years with the, with the fusion system. So I'd say those are the, the ones that jump from my memory and mind right now. Awesome. So how, how long uh, these two phase anodes, the uh, phase one, how long does that phase actually last? Like I know it's probably different depending on the environment, but but what's the range? Yeah, so typically you're looking at 40 to 90 days. It may be longer than that. It might be less than that. It all comes down to the environment. So obviously we have a, a, an anode that has a voltage 
And obviously, if we reduce the resistance through higher chloride contamination, higher moisture level, then, then the anode is going to produce a higher current in those areas. The beauty with, um, I don't want to get too technical, the beauty with the, the fusion system as opposed to an ICCP system uh, is the fact that each node point is its own ICCP system. So with an ICCP system, you have a power supply and you're distributing that current over the whole structure. You don't know where that current's going with an ICCP system because you can have a lot of current going into one area and, a, and, no, and, and not as much current going in another area. So the distribution is less. With, with the fusion technology, each node is its own power supply. So you don't have that same thing. Now the rate of discharge may be slightly different, but the total amount of protection that you achieve per square foot or per square meter is going to be the same no matter where you are in the structure. And that's a massive benefit when it comes to, to current distribution of the fusion type system. Awesome, that's a good segue. Just uh, uh, Roberto asked a question, um, how is the, the ICCP phase powered, self-powered? So you kind of answered that there's a there's a power source within the, yeah, within the unit itself? There's a battery in there, there's a cell within there, and obviously once it's depleted, it switches completely over to the pure galvanic. Fantastic. Okay, um, very specific question here. Um, we have we have a stray current um, from our transit system on. I guess I, I assume it's a structure nearby. Uh, any comments with using any of these solutions? Uh, when you yeah, have, when you yeah. It really it really does depend on the level of, of stray current corrosion. Uh, a colleague of mine did a, did some work and and where we have in stray interference. And basically applying the galvanic system or a CP system actually switched it off. So the interference stopped. Um, obviously, that's dependent upon the, the, how bad it is. Obviously, if you've got high power lines that are causing that, then again, it might not be because you're talking about thousands of volts potentially going through going through these uh, these high power lines. So again, it really does depend on the scenario. But in some situations, it can help and we can stop uh, stray current corrosion from occurring. OK, OK, good to know. So um, Ken, uh, just maybe time for two more questions here. Uh, can you run uh, the ICCP s uh, system or the, um, the phase one of those th those anodes a second time? Can you recharge it again or? You can. We have we have the ability. So the one way we can extend past 30 years is by wiring it up a second wiring loop. So we can use external batteries to power the ICCP element at a second, third, fourth and fifth time. So obviously the wiring is a little bit more complicated. It's not a single wire system anymore, uh, but there are options available to extend the life of structures, uh, the, the system above and beyond the 30 years that it's pre-programmed to do. OK. Um, just time for the last question here. It uh, goes to uh, Orlando. Just we haven't addressed cost yet. So uh, Orlando asks, uh, says, great presentation, terrific presentation. Uh, what is the range of cost in uh, dollars per square foot uh, for, uh, say, a typical bridge deck of maybe 20,000 square feet? It, is there is there any range you could offer for these solutions for, for specifically the type two or the? Yeah, yeah, you're really going to have to help me on the conversion. Obviously, I work in square meters, <laughs> so you <laughs> might have to quickly help me here, Scott, on that. And then if you can, but basically, if, by 10. yeah, so basically if we have um, if we look at a typical scenario where we only have a one to one steel ratio just, um, and, and we look at it up to say 1% chloride, you're looking at really only putting two anodes per square meter. So um, you can you can convert that for me quickly. So in terms of comparing it against the systems that we have already, so if you've used like the Gaussian CC system, comparative to CC, it's cheaper on average. Um, so you're looking maybe a third or 30 percent cheaper than a CC system um, because we can deal with much wider spacings than what you can do uh, with a pure galvanic system. So they tend to be a th varies. It really does vary. So um, it tends to be a, a lot cheaper than, than, than a standard pure galvanic system. And that's one of the benefits of having this. But I mean, from a square meter cost, you're probably looking anywhere from, I would say, um, what dollars would it be? You're looking, you're looking sub, uh, probably sub two hundred dollars per square meter. So, um, yeah, if you can convert that square foot, that'd be great. <laughs> Fantastic. So, sub so would be somewhere under twenty dollars a square foot, somewhere around that range. Orlando can obviously reach out to you directly because uh, yeah, sure. we, absolutely, I can, I can work something up with you, and we can can make the conversions. It's a lot easier to do. My mental math this evening obviously is not not up to it.
Absolutely. So um, we're, uh, we're, at, we're at about time here. And yes, we have more questions to go. We didn't get to them all. So this has not been the first time you've stunned the audience with no more questions. But uh, here on the screen is uh, Dave's uh, contact information. I'll leave this up for a second and it'll obviously be, um, uh, be on the uh, slide deck that you can download from uh, the website shortly thereafter. So um, thanks, Dave, for sharing all your, your experience and expertise and, and uh, these innovative solutions with us today. On behalf of everyone here in the Concrete Preservation Alliance, thank you very much. Thank you. So um, again, as I mentioned, we have lots more to come in the, in the new year in 2021. Um, we'll be looking forward to getting 2020 behind us. Uh, next up is uh, David Whitmore, who is uh, who's going to be speaking about the evaluation and protection of bonded or grouted post-tension tendons. That's on um, January 13th, which is again a Wednesday, webinar Wednesday. And uh, so please join us for that if you can. This kind of brings us to the end of the presentation. Um, please, uh, please take what you learned here and go out in the community and save some, save some structures if you can. Uh, it's been a difficult year for everybody. I know holidays are upon us. So take care of yourselves and be safe. And uh, we hope to see you again very soon in 2021. Thank you.